Okay, so yeah, let's let's talk about this real quick here. So what do we do? They they want us to find all points of intersection of these two curves, these two functions. Yes, ma'am. Uh, so okay, that's we are going to do that at some point, right? But before we even do that, let, let's try to think about a strategy here. We want to write the points of intersection as ordered pairs. Right? So we want to find the x and y values for each of the points where these functions intersect. If multiple interse intersections exist, separate them with commas. Right? So, so what, what could we do here? Let's, let's think about this in terms of maybe a picture for just a second. So what if we had... Let's make this function red. Okay, let's just, I mean, you wouldn't have to do this graph, but I just want to put this in context a little bit. So let's say we've got these two, I, these are not meant to be exact by any means. Let's say that's the red graph. Okay. And let's say this is the blue graph. Okay, so maybe this one does something like. So where are the points of intersection there? What's that mean? The three points on the line. Yeah, where they where they cross, right? We want the three places where they cross. So there's one place, there's one place, and there's one place, right? And maybe there aren't three. There may not be, but I just drew it where there's three. Uh, what's true at each of those points? Like for example, let's take this point right here. What can you tell me about the red x and y values compared to the blue x and y values at that point? They're the same, right? They're the same. That's important, right? So if they're the same, how do you think I could go about setting up a math situation, meaning an equation, where we could find the places where these functions intersect? Yeah, really I'm just setting them equal to each other, right? I'm just going to be asking the math gods here, where... What are the places where these x and y values are the same as those x and y values? Right? Well, think what the function does here. The function, you know, x cubed, blah, 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 over here, this cubic, is calculating the blue y values, right? And this quadratic function over here is calculating the red y values. But we want to know where those values are the same, right? At the places where those y values are the same, We'll, we'll end up finding the corresponding x values. Okay, so so let's let's do that. So if we so once again we said I think we said this was the this was the blue function, right? And this was the red function. So we just want to know when is x cubed minus seven x squared minus nine x plus 64 equal to negative x squared minus 2x plus 4, right? Does that make sense? Now, how many different kinds of variables are there in that equation? Say it again. Four. Four. How, how are you seeing four? Seven. Well, there's seven. How many different, let me say that different, how many different variables are there in that equation that I just built? One. There, one. What is it? X. X. You might be thinking, well, we got X cubes, but those are just those are just parts of a function. The only variable in there is X, right? When we determine which are like terms, then we can only combine like powers of X, sure, stuff like that. But there's only one variable in there. It's X, right? So in this equation, what do you think I'm going to be solving for if I can find a way to solve this equation for the x values that make it true? What are those going to represent? Can't we just We can. You're right. And we'll do that stuff. But before we even do that, I want you to look ahead a little bit. When I end up solving this, we're going to do a bunch of algebra here. We're going to kind of shift into algebra mode and forget about the problem for now because we've already built our equation, right? But when we end up solving this thing, we get, let's just say x equals 6 and x equals 2 and x equals 11 or something. What are those, what are those going to mean in terms of the, the graph that I drew? 
those are going to be the not x. There's going to be the places, the x values where the two functions cross, right? Does that make sense? Doesn't that? Make, I mean, think about think about what we just did here. It's really important in math to to sometimes think about stuff. You don't just get bogged down doing do a lot of practicing of algebra, which is important. But don't get so bogged down in just working on just the algebra stuff that you lose sight of kind of the bigger picture here, right? This is pretty cool what we did. By setting this equation, or this expression, right, which is the blue function equal to the red one, if we solve this thing, think what that means. When are these y values going to equal those y values? And the solutions we get for x are going to be those places. They're going to be the, the, the places, meaning the x values, where the y values are equal. Isn't that what we want? We want the places where the two graphs intersected, meaning where both the red and the blue x and y values were the same, right? Does that make sense? Okay. So now we can just kind of shift into algebra mode and solve this thing. So what do we get? I get I'm going to want to. What do I do to this equation to solve it first? Terms. Combine like terms. Push everything to one side, right? I'm going to put it into standard form where it's set equal to zero. So we'll put everything on the left side. So I'm going to have to. Looks like I'm going to add x squared to both sides, add 2x, and subtract 4. And if I do all that stuff, I'm going to get 0 over there, right? Because all those terms cancel, which is what I want. And on the other side, I'm just going to get x cubed, what's that, minus 6x squared minus 7x plus 60. Everybody agree? I had that stuff, huh? Okay. So they told me one thing, too. They told me that one intersection occurs when x is negative 3. Okay, so how could that be helpful? Okay, so that's a 0, isn't it? Right? That's going to be a 0 of this function. Now, this is, is this function right here, the, the black function, is that, does that represent either one of the two graphs, blue or red? No, not really. It doesn't. But... The solutions of this black equation are going to be the places where the red and blue graphs cross, right? Because that's how we got this equation, right? We just put this, this blue and red equation into standard form, right, to solve it better, okay? So we know that this is 1, 0, so we know right away then that I could break this thing. It's going to factor into x minus negative 3. Well, x minus negative 3 is x plus 3 times some other factor that we don't know yet, right? We're going to find that factor, but we don't know it yet. And this whole thing is equal to 0. Well, to find that, aren't I just going to divide my the black polynomial by x plus 3 synthetically, right? And then whatever's left over is going to be the factor that's multiplied by x plus 3, right? So this is that synthetic division stuff. So let's set that up. Okay, so if we want to set up the synthetic division, what number goes in the bracket? Negative 3 does. That's my 0, isn't it? Right? And we can see right here that's going to be the 0 of the, the denominator because I'm going to divide the black polynomial by the purple one to get the orange one, right? Okay, so we get a negative 3 here. And what are my coefficients going to be? 1, negative 6. Everybody see where we're getting those? Right? Those are coming from here. Right? Okay, and then we know negative 3 is a 0. So what's going in there? 0. All we need to do is find out what goes here, right? Whatever goes here, is going to tell us what that other polynomial is, right? So let's do the process then. How do I do this synthetic division again? What do I do to start things going? Okay, good. So I bring the 1 down. 1 times negative 3 is? Add those up, and what do I get? 
times negative 3. So that gives me 20. Negative 3 times 20 is my negative 60, right? And that will add to 0, so it works. Okay, what's that mean then? These are just coefficients, right? Which one is this? Constant coefficient of x, coefficient of x squared. Okay, so we got it, right? So that's that's the other factor. It's 1x squared, which I would just write as x squared, minus 9x plus 20. Okay, And now that was useful. Think what we did there. We took this information that we were given, and by dividing out that factor, we got the remaining one. If I'm trying to find all of the solutions or all the zeros, I already know this one is negative 3. Now I just have to find the zeros of this other factor, right? Okay, so let's do that. Let me grab this part. So we, we already know the 0, if I set this guy equal to 0 and solve, I get x equals negative 3. That was given to me. What about this one? What are my options here? I'm just trying to find the zeros, right? So I could either factor that right away, or I could just set that whole thing equal to 0 and solve the orange equation. And the solutions of the orange equation are going to be the other zeros, right? So let's do that. By the zero product property, I know that the product of these two things can only equal zero when either the purple one is zero or the orange one is zero. So that's when the purple factor is zero. Let's find out when the orange factor is zero. So what are my options for solving that equation? Say it again. Negative five, negative four. Okay, so I could look for magic numbers, and that's the easiest way if we can find them. What if I couldn't find any or they were hard to find? What could I always do? I could always use the quadratic formula too, right? But we can find some here. So we can break this thing up into pieces and magic numbers multiply to positive 20 and add to negative 9 or negative 5 and negative 4. So what are the zeros that go with that? 5 and 4. And so I've got all three of my zeros then. What did the original question want me to do, though? It wanted me to write the points of intersection as ordered pairs, right? So we had, uh, we had the three ordered pairs where x was 3, x was 4, and x was 5, right? Everybody agree? On that page right there, OK? Now, where would I go? to figure out what the y values were? Ideas? Yeah, to g of x or f of x, but why not use g of x? That's easier, right? So we'll just plug these x values into either one of those because they're going to be equal at this place, right? So let's plug them into here. So if I plug in negative 3, what am I going to get? Uh, I'm going to get, if I plug in negative 3, so g of negative 3 equals, what's negative 3 squared? 9 times negative 1, right? So I get negative 9 minus 2 times negative 3 plus 4. What is that? Negative 9 plus 6 plus 4, so 1. Is that right? Yeah. So we end up getting g of negative 3 equals 1. So, whoops, sorry, wrong spot. So there's one ordered pair, negative 3, 1. If I plug in 4, what am I going to get? I get negative 16 minus 8, right, uh, plus 4. So what's that? Negative 24 plus 4? What's that? Negative 20. And then finally, if I plug in 5, I'm going to get negative 5 squared is negative 25 minus 10 
plus 4. So negative 35 plus 4? Negative 31. So those would be my answers. Right? Does that make sense? Okay, good. So we got it. All right, so what about something like this? What about something like that? What if we want to, same kind of deal, right? We want to find all the real zeros of this polynomial, polynomial but what's missing this time? Uh, they, didn't, they didn't give us a shortcut. They didn't give us a value. So it's got four terms. Our strategy for four terms to factor it would be what? Cut it in half and group it. It's not going to work, though. It's not going to work because look at the ratios here. Negative 5 over 4 is not the same as negative 9 over negative 18. We could try it, but it's not going to work. It's not going to work. So we're stuck. But there is, there's another, there's a, there's a way out here. There's another way we can do this. Uh, there's, a, there's a theorem when we've got a polynomial function that has integer coefficients. And what are integers again? They're real, they're, it's a set of real numbers, but which ones? They're kind of the convenient ones, right? They're, say it again. They're counting numbers, positive or negative counting numbers. We could say positive or negative whole numbers, we could say, right? So they're all the places. I always think of it when you have a big number line and you have all the hash marks. The hash marks are at the integers, aren't they? Right? Okay, so if you have a polynomial function that has integer coefficients, then if it's going to have rational zeros, meaning zeros that could be written in the form of a fraction. And integers are fractions. The integer 7 is really the fraction 7 divided by what? 1. Yeah. So it really is a fraction, right? If it has zeros that can be written as fractions, then here's the trick. Those zeros, the numerator has to be a factor of the constant and the denominator has to be a factor of the leading coefficient. It's that way every time. Okay? Here's, the, here's what it looks like. It's called the rational zero theorem or the rational root theorem. And it just says, what I just said, if p of x is some polynomial with integer coefficients, then for m over n to be a zero, it has to be, the, what has to be true is that m has to be a factor of the constant term and n has to be a factor of the leading coefficient. So for us, how is that useful? So when we take a problem like this, we could make a list of all the possible zeros that we could try synthetically to see if one works. Okay, it looks, and it looks pretty bad at first, but I'll, I'll tell you why it's not so bad. So what are, the, what are the possibilities here? So we'd get x equals, on the top, we have to find that the numerator is going to be all the factors of the constant. So what are all the factors, the integer factors of 9? 3, Three one. 1, and Zero. 9. Right? And so we could take the positive or negative of each of those. So we could do plus or minus 1, plus or minus 3, and plus or minus 9. Okay, what about the denominator? We said the denominator is formed from all the possible factors of the leading coefficient. So what are all the factors of 4? 2. Well, 1, right? 1, 2, and 4. So that's, that's a mess. I mean, that's a lot of possibilities. Think about those. If the bottom is plus or minus 1, then that would mean we'd have the possible zeros would be these integers. 1 divided by 1, 3 divided by 1, 9 divided by 1, plus or minus each of those, right? What if it's not 1 on the bottom? If it's 2, then I could have plus or minus 1 halves, 3 halves, or 9 halves. And if it's 4, we can have plus or minus 1 fourth, 3 fourths, or 9 fourths. Okay, but in, in reality, what almost always happens is when we're looking for these things, we're going to start with the easy ones. And once we get one of them, from there it's all downhill. If we just do a single <coughs> zero, if we, could get, if we could stumble onto one of those zeros, then that's going to make this into a much easier polynomial to deal with, right? What's left over we can deal with, it's going to be quadratic. And we could just use that if we need to, right? So what we always want to do then is we want to start with the integers. So we're going to, we're going to assume to begin with that the denominator is 1, okay? And we'll just look at the integers up here. We'll start with the small ones and work our way up to the bigger ones, okay? So let's try this, okay? So 
what is, if we try this synthetically, what are the coefficients? What are they? So we're going to see if any of these are zeros of this polynomial. So what are the zeros of this polynomial? I mean, the energy, uh, the coefficient, sorry. Four, negative five, negative 18, negative nine. Okay, and we're just going to try out, we'll try out uh, all of the the possibilities where the bottom is one. So these are going to be um, integers, right? So let's make a list of just the <laughs> integers, and we'll go through that list. So our list is going to be like this. Plus or minus one, plus or minus three, plus or minus nine, right? So let's, let's try one, see if one works. That's an easy number to multiply by. Right, so we'll start with the really easy one. So what do I do synthetically then? Uh, Bring down the 4. 4 times 1 is? Plus negative, negative 5. Four. Negative 1. Negative plus negative, negative 18. Two. Are we going to get 0 in there? No. no. We're not going to. right? So we can cross positive 1 off the list. It's not going to work. So let's move on. We'll try negative 1. Uh, so... This, yeah, this, this is going to take a little bit of time, potentially, isn't it, right? But once you find one, it, it gets easier. So start over again. Okay, and we'll make that out front. We'll make that a minus one. So now I bring down the four, just like before. Negative, Negative one times four is? Negative four. Negative four, good. Add those up. Negative. Negative 1 times negative 9. Um, uh, negative, nine. negative 1 times negative 9 is? Zero. Okay, and it worked, right? It worked. Okay, so we know that, that negative 1 was a winner. Okay, that's 1, 0. Now, the rest of them are going to be easy because what's left over? What does this look like? That's the constant, right? Coefficient of x, coefficient of x squared, right? So what we're left with is that simple quadratic polynomial. I want to find the zeros of that, right? Because that's what we're trying to do, is find the zeros, right? So let's set that equal to zero and solve. Well, what are our options here? What are our options here? Okay, yeah, I mean, we could, we could try to factor it, but if we're going to factor it, it's going to be bottoms up, right? Because A is not equal to 1. Uh, bottoms up, to me, is kind of hard to do. So, I mean, it's, to me, I would just use the quadratic formula. I wouldn't even try to mess around, probably, with, with uh, bottoms up. I mean, we could. We have to find numbers that multiply to negative 36 and add to negative 9, so it would be negative 12 and 3. We could do it. It would work. But we could also just forget about that and, and try out quadratic formulas. So what are my values of A, B, and C in that quadratic equation? 4, negative 9, negative 9. 4, negative 9, negative 9. Okay, so then we can plug these into the quadratic formula. X equals negative B, so that's going to be 9, right? Plus or minus the square root of B squared. What's negative 9 squared? 3. Negative 9 squared. 81. 81. Minus 4 times negative, or no, times 4, sorry, times negative 9, all divided by 2a, what's that? 8. Okay, so let's figure out what number is inside the radical here. Uh, negative 4 times 4 times negative 9. I'm multiplying two negatives together, right? So those are going to become... <laughs> Cancel out, become positive. So let's figure out what number we're adding to 81. 4 times 9 times 4. 4 times 9 is? 36. 36. And if I multiply something by 4, I'm just doubling it how many times? How many? Twice. So 36 doubled is what? 76. 72. 
double again. What's 72 double? 144. Okay, so all this stuff in here just becomes, inside the radical, just becomes 81 plus 144. But what's 144 plus 80? 224. Good. Plus another one is what? 225. Okay, so then this is just equal to 9 plus or minus the square root of 225 over 8. Well, what's the square root of 225? 15. Yeah, that's a perfect square. So that's 15. So then we end up with x equals 9 plus or minus 15 over 8. Well, that's easy, right? Now all we have to do is take the plus sign and the minus sign and see what, see what the two results are. So what if we take the plus sign? What do we get? Brandon, what do we get? If I take the plus sign, what's 9 plus 15? 24. You buy that, 24? Mm -hmm. 24, does that make sense? Okay, what, what's the, the mental math thing? You might you notice I kind of, I, I walk you guys through this because I think it's important, and, and I probably mentioned this before, but the same, have you guys done a pair of this? I, there we go. Up here, folks, up here. So whenever you add 9 to a digit, what's that doing? Okay, the 1's digit is going to drop by 1, and the 10's digit goes up, right? Does that make sense? So if I added 10 to this, I'd get 25. So 9 is 1 less than that. So I know the 5's going to drop to a 4, but that's going to go up to a 2, right? So we get 24. So we get 24. One solution is 24 over 8. What does that simplify to? Three. Okay, so if we take the plus sign in the quadratic formula, we get the 0x equals 3. What if we take the minus sign? What's 9 minus 15? Negative 6. Negative 6. Good. <coughs> so I get negative 6 over 8. If I reduce that, what do I get? Uh, negative 2 over... Wait, 1 over 4. 3 over 4. 3 over 4. Okay, so then what are my, what are my answers? We wanted to find all the zeros. Well, we had 3 and negative 3 fourths, and then negative 1, right? was the one that, that worked from our list up here. Does that make sense? Okay. So that's how did this work? Well, it was this rational root theorem allowed us to find a list of different choices that we could, we could try out and see which one of those worked, right? Okay, last thing I'm going to show you, and then I'll give you a work day tomorrow. The last thing I want to show you is... So just give me a second here, and then we'll. I, 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 there's a lot, but I mean Monday's a short day, so I kind of wanted to do this on Monday so you could have a longer work day. Uh, what about something like this? If I want to find all the real zeros, the the leading coefficient is one, right? So the denominator is just going to be one anyway, right? So really, all we have to look for are just going to be the factors of the constant, which is twelve divided by one, which makes doesn't change it. So what are those? What's our list going to be? Plus or minus what? What are all the factors of 12, starting with the small ones? 1, one 2, two three, 4, 6, 12. So that's a lot, right? I've got quite a few to go by, but the odds are we're going to stumble onto one of those early anyway, right? So we'll start with the easy ones. But I want to show you kind of a shortcut way for doing this because it's kind of a pain to have to redraw that synthetic bracket every time you audition a new number. So here's what you can do instead. Let's put the coefficients in here. So we end up with 1, negative 9, 27, negative 31, and 12. And then each time, say it again. Well, we want to, so what we want to do is we're just going to try to run these through synthetically and see if any, which one of these gives us a 0. So we'll just start with like 1. How about start with an easy one. Uh, actually, let's start with negative ones. I think one's going to work. I want to do one that doesn't work. Uh, maybe one doesn't work. One. Yeah, let's try that one. Okay, so I'm going to run through. Here's how I'm going to do this. I'm going to put out. I'm going to put the bracket on the next row, and I'm going to put the one there. And I'm going to combine the two things that we do with some synthetic division into one row. So, think what, what I want you to think of is what would end up being below the bar in synthetic division. So I bring the 1 all the way down, right? 
And then what would I do? I take that number and multiply by one and add to that number, right? So let's just do all that stuff at once. One times one is one plus <coughs> negative nine is what? Negative eight. So that's the number that would be below the bar, right? Negative eight times one is plus 27. 19. 19 times 1 is 19 plus negative 31 is what? Is going to be 12, right? Negative 12. Agreed? Does that make sense? Everybody see that? Because 19 times 1 is 19 plus negative 13 is negative 12. And then negative 12 times 1 is what? Is what? Can I see other Yeah, Ellie, sure. So what is that? Negative 12 times 1 is what? Negative 12 plus 12 is 0. Okay, so we got a hit, right? So we know that 1 is a, is a 0. That's a solution, okay? What, but now we're left with another polynomial here that's smaller. Instead of having four terms, or five, this one's only got four. So all we'd have to do is just go again, right? Well, let's try one again because it might work. Does everybody see this pattern? So then we'll go down, let's pick a new color, and let's try one again. And now this becomes the top row of coefficients because that one went to zero. You see that? So we bring the 1 down. 1 times 1 is 1 plus negative 8 is what? Negative 7. 1 times negative 7 is negative 7 plus 19 is 12. Right? Uh, and then this is going to be the box we're checking for. 1 times 12 is 12 plus negative 12 is 0. It worked. Right? So 1 showed up twice. And now what we're left with is just three terms, so that's going to be quadratic, isn't it? Right, so this would just become x squared minus 7x plus 12 equals 0. I've already got those two zeros. All I'd have to do is either magic numbers or use the quadratic formula, so right? are they both positive 1 or is 1, 1, 1 negative so, 1? So what it would be is x minus 1 squared, but it's okay. When, you, when you're putting in, when it wants all the real zeros, you could either put 1, 1, and then these two are going to be, what, uh, 4 and 4. Uh, the zeros would be 4 and 3. So I could either put that, or I could put 1, 3, 4, and they'd both be right. It wouldn't matter. Okay. In Moodle. Does that make sense? Yeah. That's a lot. All right. I'm ready to work tomorrow.